Hello and welcome to Media Monitor on the SABC News Channel, independent and impartial. And this is, of course, where we every week take a look inside the world of the media, analysing some of the trends, the issues and the reporting of some of the week's top stories. I'm Peter Ndoro and uh, this is what's coming up on the show today. Uh, is blogging journalism? Uh, we've also got, also got social media influencers who are taking up a lot of media space. Uh, we take a look at the art of blogging, uh, what it's about and just what sets it apart from journalism. That's all coming up in a short while. But we also uh, will be talking, uh, heading to Zimbabwe to catch up on the latest uh, regarding uh, the t detainment of well-respected Zimbabwean journalist who was arrested on Monday. And uh, we'll get to the bottom of that. Was it legitimate or was this uh, police harassment? We'll be talking to somebody in Zimbabwe about that particular story. Uh, and in our Back in History feature, well, we take you back to the 2nd of December 2001. And I hope that uh, many of you might remember what uh, the special event took place uh, uh, on that day. Find out a little bit later on in the program uh, what we'll be remembering. Okay, don't forget you can also engage with us on social media. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, you can uh, use the Twitter hashtag, hashtag SABC Media Monitor, to share your thoughts on anything that uh, you might see on the program. And you can also dial us uh, voice notes, video notes, or call us on uh, WhatsApp. And our number is 065-862-4548. That's 65 Eight six two four five four eight. Okay, so that's the program, and uh, we hope that you stay with us for all of that and more. But first, let's start and take a look at uh, what's on the front pages of our newspapers today. And we begin with the uh, Sunday Times, and uh, their uh, COVID-19 corruption leads the Sunday Times with anti-corruption investigators probing what is believed to be a sickening slew of allegations that unscrupulous officials and businesses are benefiting from billions meant to be fighting the coronavirus pandemic. All right, the City Press, uh, the cover there is uh, leading with a story about uh, the row over former President uh, Jacob Zuma's role in the Andrew Mlangeni funeral. The late struggle icon, of course, died uh, this past week. Apparently, the family uh, of the uh, Rivonia trialist want Zuma off the list of virtual reflectors, uh, uh, reflection session to be held ahead of the Stalwarts Memorial Service. So that's the City Press. Let's take a look at the Sunday Independent now and uh, the cover there. The Sunday Independent is also pointing to what looks like officials benefiting from COVID-19 contracts. The paper's reporting that the wives of two men at the centre of a 125 million rand PPE contract awarded to King uh, Matsukani uh, Tandaziwe uh, Digo are close friends who served each other as bridesmaids at their respective weddings. And the king is the husband, of course, of pres presidential spokesperson Kusela Diko, who's friends with the wife of the Gauteng MEC for Health. And of course, it was the Gauteng uh, Health Department that awarded this contract. So that's the Sunday Independent. The Sunday Tribune is uh, leading with the yesterday's iconic race, the Durban July, that uh, went ahead without spectators. Now, whilst the event was able to go ahead, sadly, the city says that because no people were allowed, the, race, the city lost around 300 million rand and lots of jobs were lost. Usually around 50,000 people attend uh, this uh, uh, event each year. And the Sunday World, well, let's take a look at what's on the front page of that paper. And uh, it's got uh, former Bosasa executive Angelo Agrizzi. He's being asked by liquidators uh, to pay 100 million rand. Now, apparently, he siphoned off this uh, money uh, using businesses that he owned. All right, so that is the situation in terms of uh, the papers and we'll take a closer look at those papers a little bit later on in the program. Now before we get into some of uh, the uh, uh, highlighted uh, program items let's take a look at what's trending on social media because that's where a lot of people consume their media now and uh, so this is what's the top list this week end and uh, the, f the first uh, one is sacred space and that usually trends actually it's quite a big famous popular one it's a, a 
uh, program on Radio Metro. Uh, Tamin Gubeni leads it. Uh, but the trend that really fascinated me, of course, is the EFF turning seven, and a lot of people have just been putting their messages uh, online and uh, sharing their thoughts about uh, the uh, EFF turning seven. And this black is they're trying to say to people, wear black, not red today, so that um, we mourn those that have died. We can't be celebrating. Uh, during this time. So people just posting their pictures, posting their messages um, and uh, yeah, some of them posting their pictures with their president of course, uh, Julius Malema, who should be speaking around about 12 o'clock today we believe, uh, addressing the party faithful, a party that uh, really surprised many I think when it was formed. They didn't think it would grow as much as it did, but it certainly has become one of the most influential parties right across the country. Okay, so that is the situation, but uh, right after this, we're going to start uh, unpacking, blogging, social media, all of that uh, in the world of journalism. Stay with us. Right, now more and more we're discovering new types of media content. Much of it is on social media platforms and some of it uh, not so new but is being seen increasingly as people get connected and spend more time online. Blogs, yeah, but what are they? Well, a definition suggests that a blog is a discussion or an informal website that's published on the World Wide Web, consisting of discrete, often informal, diary-style text entries. Well, we asked today, is blogging a form of journalism and social media influencers also have their pages? What about them? Well, let's find out from our panel joining us via Zoom. We're joined by Khaupalilwe uh, Pala Itzilia, who's uh, Jacaranda FM senior reporter, entertainment vlogger, Owuwa uh, Mishongwane, and Professor Ilva Rodney Gumede, uh, professor uh, at the School of Communication at the University of Johannesburg. Thanks so much indeed for joining us uh, to my panel and my team. Welcome to the program. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Great to Hi, see you all everybody. there. <laughs> all right. Let me start with you, Prof, because, uh, you know, your job as an academic is to look at these trends. And I'm just wondering, when we, when we look at this, um, blogging is something that's been there for a long time, uh, but it's now almost starting to become more mainstream. We'll talk about what social media influences and uh, um, uh, Twitter and vloggers do, but your thoughts initially on blogs. Is it journalism? Well, it, it, of course it can be. Journalism isn't defined by the platform, and we can talk a little bit more about that as well. I think what you say now is really interesting, though. So when we talk about blogging, when we talk about social media, particularly in the current context of the COVID pandemic that has hit us globally. Of course, as uh, journalists work from home, they also reach out on different platforms. This is something that journalists have adopted long before the COVID pandemic and the so social media and the proliferation of social media, of course, has been with us for a very, very long time, Peter. But I think that it's important to also to, to see how it's being amped up in certain contexts. And of course, when people don't gather in a newsroom um, as they used to do to the same extent anymore social media becomes more uh, um uh, more, may, maybe more central to some of, our, of the core business that the news media do. But absolutely, blogging can be journalism. It's not, journalism is not dependent on the platform. All right. Well, let's uh, talk to Khao uh, Palilwe, who does both. You're a vlogger and a uh, journalist as well. Is there a difference in your mind when you're doing both? Well, for me, there is, because I had to make a decision on whether I'm going to blog about the stories that I cover as a journalist or whether I'm going to find something else that's interesting that I do that I blog about. 
I do do a lot of articles on the stories I do as a journalist that I put on um, the website that for the company I work for. But I decided my blog needs to be different. It needs to define me outside of journalism. So what other interesting thing do I have? I'm a mommy and I'm a feminist and people seem to like the advice I give and the post that I post about my kids and what I do with my kids. So I decided, let me formalize that. So I did a little bit of research and I found a website called Wix and I started there. That's where I've started. You create, you basically create your own website. So I'm not an expert, but I created it and I decided to stay clear of journalism in terms of my blog, mostly because I feel like I already give out that in terms of the company I work for. Maybe one day I'll decide to put it on a blog, but for now I decided to just blog about parenting, um, my feminism journey, and people are loving it. I mean, I blog about the purees I make for my nine-month-old. People actually want to know, what do you make? What do you do? Um, I, I I have a... Um, a, 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 a sort of like a feature which I call myth bust, where mm. I bust some myths mm. about pregnancy, about parenting. So it's actually quite fun. I'm loving it. But Peter, it's a lot of work. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, oh, I mean, I, I'm curious about uh, vlogging. I mean, back in the day when I was much younger, we used to wait until Sunday and there was the entertainment page. People like Gwen Gill were quite famous for, uh, you know, uh, keeping us up to date with what celebrities and things were doing. Um, and vlogging has changed that quite a bit because it's more immediate and it's more visual. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that kind of uh, um, uh, journalism. I'll put it, I'll call it that because in a sense you're telling stories that people want to hear and see. <laughs> <laughs> um actually like for me to be honest with you i i don't consider myself to be a journalist but i've seen a lot of people actually refer me to to one um but to be honest with you like it's so much fun it's so much fun yes i do uh, a lot of research obviously online um to be able to obviously get the stories that i'm talking about as i blog um you know entertainment in south africa um, and as you just said, like it's definitely taking over because we don't have to wait now, you know, the weekend or whenever. Like, um, I obviously blog or almost on a daily basis, so everything is always happening. Obviously, Twitter is happening, Instagram is happening, you know, celebrities are just living their lives, and we're basically just uh following them in a way. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm um, and so. Yeah. I'm going to stay with you because I'm curious now. I'm seeing a lot of people using different platforms, not just um, a YouTube channel, but also Twitter and Instagram. Is this something that you have to do? Um, is it different things on, on different sites or are you using the same material on those different sites? How do you do it? Um, so basically what happens is, isn't it like, um, okay, I'll, I'll definitely speak because for YouTube mostly because, uh, I put all my material on YouTube. So on Twitter and on Instagram, that's basically where I source everything. So if maybe a celebrity, um, you know, responds rudely or they announce something amazing that's happening, then that's where I get that information and obviously. Um, posted on my YouTube channel. Now, of course, I am going to still take the link from the YouTube channel, put it back on Twitter, put it back um, on Instagram sometimes, you know, the swipe ups and also um, Facebook. So I definitely say all the social media, they definitely work together. You just have to find uh, where you, ma you make money from and then obviously, you know, make sure that you focus on that and then you use the other social media platforms as um, obviously where you're going to just share because that's where majority of the people are. You mentioned something quite important there, money. Professor Elva, and I guess at the end, even journalists have to make money and it may come to a point where they have to choose, don't they? Do they go this route? Because some of these social media influencers have more followers than papers that are being sold uh, by entire newspaper groups. As you're teaching your students now, are you teaching vlogging, blogging, um, and tweeting? Because it is now a distribution channel 
that has a ready audience. Absolutely. And as you say, you know, journalism has changed and the platforms that we report on have, have changed. So, of course, that's built into any journalist training today. And whether we teach blogging or, or straightforward, you know, print media reporting or whether it's blogging then when it's with videos, whether it's how we handle uh, tweets and Twitter. And most journalists, as been said already, do have uh, either a Twitter feed that directly links back to the uh, news media that they, they work for, for example, or they might be independent journalists, or they might be doing something on the side, blogging on the side, like we, we heard about, whether it's about their, their own private lives or about a hobby that they have or whatever it might be. And those are important aspects of, of selling your name or branding yourself as well. But it doesn't take away, and I think it's really important that when we talk about what the difference is, uh, or if there's a difference between blogging and journalism, journalism, for example, it's important to remember that there are four main pillars of what is considered journalism. The first is about how we report things, and we need to report things fairly, accurately, and truthfully, and that's one very important pillar. The other one is how, about how we obtain news, and that has to be, news has to be obtained and information has to be obtained legally, and, and truthfully, and etc. And that's also, you know, the second very important uh, pillar. Another very important aspect, uh, aspect of journalism is how we seek people's views. When we report on people, for example, or we report on issues, we need to get some kind of a balance into our reporting. We need to try to seek the views of the people that we are reporting on. So that's a third very uh, important pillar. And, and a fourth uh, uh, sort of very much um, important pillar, and this is something comes back to someone said that I'm not, I don't consider myself a journalist. Well, I consider myself a journalist, and if I'm out reporting, I have to identify myself as being a journalist and when I do so it means that I actually um, uh, conform to these other pillars then that I just mentioned about being truthful seeking the views of others and so on so I think that those are really really important aspects of the four main pillars of what mm -hmm. we consider journalism uh, another important thing and this is also in our press code actually and our press code actually regulates social media to a certain degree as well uh, as, as, as far as it, uh, is it connected to uh, uh, a media or mainstream media house for example but another important aspect aspect of journalism is that we don't spread incitement to do harm, hate speech, etc. Right. And I think that this is where it often goes wrong on social media. We actually move into a realm that we have no control over. And I think those are very, very important aspects of, of trying to sash up what journalism is. Fascinating. Um, Oh, um, um, yeah, um, oh, um, I'm curious about this ability that you're trying to have to separate the two between your role as a journalist and your role as a blogger. Um, because people will see your name, uh, your byline in a paper, and it used to be that was it, that was how you were identified. But now you're going to have two different identities. And it's quite possible your blog identity becomes bigger than your newspaper identity. And then people start to say, but what are you? Are you a blogger trying to be a journalist or are you a journalist trying to be a blogger? Is that something that you think about or you just do what you do? So it's something that has followed me my whole entire life and career because I've always had these two different identities. Yeah. So people separate them, but I don't think they are separate because as a journalist, I can be an activist and that's what I am. So I've always had this question of what are you? Are you a journalist or are you an act a gender activist, a feminist? What exactly are you? So I've always had that. But I've also realized that... Um, I am a journalist who is an activist and that's okay. And the reason why I separated the two was because one is an interest, the other is also an interest, but also a career. Um, and I find that even in my blogging, I do say that I am a journalist and that's what has given me also the credibility that I have as the blogger that I am. So people trust me more in what I say more because of the research background that the prof was just mm. talking about that I have. They trust that the things that I say on my blog are not just things that I get from nowhere, but they are things that are thoroughly researched because of my training as a journalist. And even on the blog, so I use Facebook, Twitter and Instagram to grab attention as well to get people onto my blog. Um, I do mention things like, you know, I'm covering this story today. So people do know that this is a dynamic mom because I'm not just one person. Yeah. There's 
it's a lot of me, you know. So we'll see how it goes. If my <laughs> if my blog identity is bigger, I will still use that identity to push my new stories and to remind people that I am still a journalist. I'm still credible. I still do the actual work as well. And this is also work. <laughs> okay. I know you've kept them separate, but have you been tempted sometimes to fuse the two? Because sometimes a story is of personal interest to you and you write it in a different way on a blog uh, to how you might write it on, uh, in the paper. Not as yet, but it's something yeah. I am thinking about in terms of stories that are related to what my blog is about. So okay. my blog is about being a feminist and being a mother. So there are sometimes days where I will cover stories that are related to my blog. Like recently, there was a survey about the impact of um, COVID-19 on people in South Africa in terms of job losses. And the research found that of the, of the 3 million people who lost their jobs, 2 million were women. That wow. is something that I as a blogger, I'm interested in and something I would like to reflect on. So on my blog as well, I don't just write. I also have live Facebook chats. Yeah. So I'll have a guest like you are now and interview people. So that is something also I like to incorporate as well. Um, even I interview people even about COVID-19. The other day I interviewed two nurses about the impact of, of COVID-19 in their lives as, as, as nurses because we always hear from doctors and researchers, but we rarely hear from nurses. Yeah. So I do it. I, th these two work together. They okay. complement each other really well, and I'm really, really enjoying it. All right. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious because entertainment, vlogging, YouTubing, um, I, we've just heard from uh, Prof. Ilva about the pillars of journalism. Do you think vloggers mm -hmm. follow the same kind of code, or they just do what they do, and uh, sometimes mm -hmm. gossip comes across as if it's uh, truth. Um, well, you know, sometimes obviously gossip will come as if it is the truth. Um, I will not speak for other bloggers, but um, I definitely do follow, uh, you know, I do follow the rules in terms of, I mean, I also do want to be fair. I also always make sure that what I'm reporting to my followers is the truth. And I think that's why, like, I've been able to build such a huge following because mm -hmm. I have over 130,000. And I think at the moment um, I'm the uh, lead most subscribed uh, entertainment channel in South Africa um, right. that is obviously independently owned. So basically, I definitely say that the reason why I say I'm not a journalist is because I do understand that there's a lot of effort um, and, you know, journalists do go to school to become journalists and everything I, I do, you know, is something that I, I learned online and obviously, you know, my main uh, source, my main aim is basically to entertain. Now, of course, whenever information comes, that's where like I will be able to obviously tell them uh, if something is alleged, if this is a fact, obviously if it's something that I saw, then obviously that is a fact and that's why in my videos, I always make sure that I provide proof of whatever it is I'm talking about. So I stay away from people that will come to me and just, you know, tell me that somebody did something without proof and I'm going to be going out there and reporting on it, which I feel like that also differentiates uh, blogging with being a journalist because as a blogger, you can basically just say allegedly and people will run with that. But um, I honestly don't do that. Okay. <laughs> and if you check my page, like <clears throat> I honestly don't do that. Um, I just have so much respect for journalists and uh, that I just feel like me saying I'm a journalist, like it will be a bit of a disrespect no, to them. But because, you are, you, you are. Know, I never went to a lot of people anything. trust you and believe in you. <laughs> and the moment you tell a story, you're a journalist. Prof, we're going to have to start mm -hmm. wrapping this up. So I'm going to give you the final word. Consumers of all of this, papers, uh, YouTube, blogs, and so on and so forth. How should we view all of this and make sense of what each one represents and uh, so that we can give it the weight that it deserves? I think uh, a very important aspect of it is trust. And it's been mentioned a couple of times. So whether we have the trust of an audience already, because we are trusted journalists, we have worked for, for trusted news outlets, and then we take that into to something else, uh, that's all good. But it doesn't come with the requisite editorial oversight still. So, so there's a lot of, of uh, you know, 
the, the, the quite literal meaning of trust, that the audience trusts us to do what's right, to conform to certain rules, to certain standards. My thinking is always uh, that we need to declare to our audiences what we do and why we do it. So when we are blogging in our personal capacity, and this has been pointed out by the panelists as well, we do so and we, we're upfront with it. Now, I'm talking in my capacity as a gender activist, now I'm talking in my capacity as a mother or whatever it might be. But when we are out there reporting the news, we are often much more anonymous. It's not about my name reporting on what's happening at hospitals during the COVID pandemic, for example. It brings very little to it. So I think that it's, it's about trust and we must be very cautious not to break that trust. But I think that there's a lot of work that we need to do as journalists, as editors, to actually reinforce certain ideas around the standard and that we are conformative to those standards that are being set and that we actually know the press code when we're working as journalists. All right, ladies, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much indeed for this fascinating chat. It's a different world that we live in, but uh, certainly one that's uh, exciting and uh, interesting to observe. Thanks so much indeed for your insights, all of you, and take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. All right. So great faces uh, of the media there chatting to us a little bit about uh, there's different types of media, uh, social media, blogging, vlogging, you name it, it's out there and it's changing the game in many respects. All right, we're going to take a quick break and when we come back we'll have more for you and events that uh, took place in Zimbabwe this past week which have disturbed many people across the world. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching Media Monitor. Now, this past week, we heard the sad news of the passing of struggle icon Andrew Mlangeni. He was uh, the last surviving Rivonia trialist. Well, today in our Back in News History feature, we take you back to the 2nd of December 2001. And this, of course, is uh, when there was a special reunion of the Rivonia trialists at the historic Lilysleaf Farm. And this was all part of the ANC's uh, 40th uh, anniversary of the uh, formation of the party's armed wing, Mkonto um, Isizwe, uh, often known as MK. And this is how the SABC News uh, team covered the story. There was an historic and emotional reunion in Ravonia, Johannesburg today. The famous Ravonia treason trialists gathered for the first time again at the farmhouse where they were arrested over 38 years ago. Today is the 40th anniversary of the ANC's armed wing, Umkonto Esizwe. It was at Lilith's Leaf Farm that Nelson Mandela and co-conspirators wrote and designed the plans to overthrow the apartheid regime. The hideout was known only to a handful of the inner circle of the ANC. Today, former trialists in the absence of Nelson Mandela, as well as Walter Sisulu, who is ill, were honored. A Lilith Farm Trust was launched to develop the site as a South African museum. It will form part of the country's national heritage sites. In July 1963, the farm was raided and most of the trialists were caught. At the time, Nelson Mandela had already been apprehended whilst traveling from Natal to Johannesburg. The trialists relate how they were arrested. On behind the trees on the way down, special branch people came out and policemen and so on. And it was like a B-grade movie, you know, hands up. But for Mlangeni, the story was different. He was arrested two weeks before the others. The police had already got the hint that uh, we had come back from Miltutene. So they were on the lookout for us. For Dennis Goldberg, the engineer and explosive expert, this was a surprise move. It was a cold winter's day. And I tell you, after the arrest, it got so cold. I don't know that the weather changed, but it felt very cold. In his address, President Tabumbeki said, these are leaders who took an important decision to take up arms to save lives and bring about freedom. When you, you saw them standing there, that is South Africa. That's the South Africa we want and... <clears throat> And we want to communicate that message to the youth of the country that that is the South Africa we want. Then it was time for the real celebration. The 
reform will be a private initiative and will be funded by the Minister of Arts and Culture. Whilst this farm will be preserved as a museum for the benefit of all South Africans, there is no doubt that it will bridge the past with the present and link to the future. Lehana Tsotetsi, SABC, Rivonia, Johannesburg. What a fascinating time uh, it was and uh, times that we've lived through. Now moving uh, further afield in what appears to be a crackdown on independent journalism in recent weeks, uh, uh, Shamaka Saeed Dara is the latest journalist uh, from La Voix uh, de Djibouti to be arrested in Djibouti. Dara was arrested on the evening of the 15th of July, according to the head of LVD, a radio station and uh, web TV based in Europe. That's uh, the only independent Djibouti-run source of national news coverage for Djibouti's residents. Dara is uh, being held in Djibouti City's 5th District uh, Police Station in the municipality of uh, Balbala and he was uh, not allowed to access uh, his lawyer uh, or his family. Very sad to see uh, these events taking place uh, in uh, Djibouti and other parts of the continent as well. And uh, talking of which, on Monday, Zimbabwe police arrested prominent whistleblowing journalist Hopol Chinono alongside uh, an opposition leader of uh, one of the smaller parties, J Jacob Ngarivumwe. And this all, of course, at the head of uh, a planned anti-government protest, uh, which is supposed to take place on the 31st of this month. Chinono recently published uh, documents raising concerns that powerful individuals in Zimbabwe uh, have been profiting from multi-million dollar deals uh, for essential supplies meant to be fighting the uh, coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic. Chinono has been charged with the incitement to participate in uh, public violence and inciting the public to commit public violence. So, on Thursday, uh, Chinono was due uh, to appear uh, due at a bail hearing, but magistrates postponed the sitting for 24 hours, blaming the COVID-19 curfew. And earlier in the week, I spoke with the Media Institute of Southern Africa, and that's Mises. Uh, national chairperson in Zimbabwe, Tabani Moyo, about uh, the arrests and uh, also uh, what uh, it meant. And this is what he said to me. The arrest uh, of Shingono in the morning uh, by probably eight uh, officers uh, from Zimbabwe Republic of Police uh, indeed heightens our fears that uh, once again the media uh, is under spotlight and uh, the crackdown uh, has not stopped uh, since uh, the beginning of the lockdown. Uh, you must be aware that uh, since uh, the 1st of April we have recorded up to 24 cases. Uh, Chingono's arrest is the 24th uh, in terms of attacks, assaults, uh, and even harassment of the media against a constitutional order, against the provisions set by the Ministry uh, of Information that uh, uh, media are essential services uh, in, during this lockdown. And again, uh, the attacks on Chingono, the arrest on Chingono, uh, shows that the more things change, the more they remain the same. Uh, we are not breaking with the past, but we, under these lockdown conditions, we are seeing a lockdown uh, of press freedom in Zimbabwe. A couple of days later, I spoke to the Zimbabwe Information Secretary, Nick Mangwana, and I asked him about uh, Chinono and other journalists uh, being harassed, and this is what he had to say. Harassment of journalists, I think um, but the we, know, courts, we know what Mr. The courts, does, of course. The they, 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 they. said you I, are harassing. I am, the secretary for, I, I, I am the secretary for information. I meet regularly with the minister and I was, I was with them last week and so on. There is, there is absolutely no case of harassment that you are talking about. They, when they went to court, they wanted journalism classified as um, an essential service of which we consider that journalism was an essential service. The oversight by the AG was pointed out. I am the first person to declare, actually, even on the day, the special instrument came out that journalism was an essential service. So journalists, in your view, are not being harassed, and that uh, what was declared by the court to stop harassing, the, the, the courts uh, weren't very clear. 
I don't know what you're talking about, Peter. Where were the courts very clear that journalism was being harassed? There was a court judgment in April uh, that was brought by Misa, and the judge said that the government must stop harassing journalists. And he used those words. Well, they, 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 the court did not find that generally the government was harassing generally. You, um, I just answer that question, Peter, because what happened on the day, or what had happened around the case, I was involved in those cases. Or not involved in the sense that I was actually involved in the intervention. Journalists were asked to produce ID cards that indicated that the steps proved that they were journalists. All right, so that was uh, Information Secretary Nick Mangwana refuting uh, what uh, Amisa's uh, uh, chair, ex executive director was uh, talking about, harassment of journalists. He says 24 journalists had been uh, arrested and harassed by police, and uh, Nick Mangwana saying, no, that is not true. But we have seen uh, Hopo Chinono being uh, taken into police custody this past week, and in fact, his work led to one of the... Uh, country's uh, ministers, the health minister, uh, being fired from his job and he's facing charges of corruption as well. All right, so we're going to take a quick break and when we come back we will uh, be speaking to a, a renowned uh, uh, author in Zimbabwe who will tell us a little bit more about uh, this story. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching Media Monitor. And one story that uh, we're focusing on, uh, particularly this week, has been, of course, the arrest of uh, journalist uh, uh, Hopal Chinono this past week. And there's been some widespread uh, reaction to the investigative journalist here at home. Uh, further afield, uh, media such as the Media Monitoring Africa, SANEF, uh, Community to Protect Journalists, uh, SOS Coalition, uh, Neiman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard University and others uh, penned a letter calling for the chair of the African Union and the president of South Africa, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, to use all available mechanisms to help secure the immediate release of uh, the jailed Zimbabwean uh, journalist. And so uh, reaction widespread and many people say that all of this really has to do with this march that's supposed to take place on the 31st of July against corruption. And uh, so this was being led by Mr. Ngari Vumwe, who is uh, an opposition leader of a party called Transform Zimbabwe. And uh, he was leading the charge online on social media, trying to get people out on the streets on the 31st. So the police picked him up and uh, he was arrested on the same day as uh, Hopal Chinono. And they both appeared in court and uh, they've been denied bail. And it looks like they're going to stay in jail until after the July the 31st, which of course is uh, the day of the uh, uh, planned march. So uh, we know that Hopal Chinono appears in court again, I believe, on the 7th of August. So getting him out of play as well, uh, it seems. But uh, the government denies this. They said that, uh, look, there's a lockdown and uh, therefore it is inappropriate for people to be marching and endangering other people by coming together in these large numbers. So that's the official line, but uh, most people not really buying into that story. Uh, Hopal Chinono being accused of inciting violence, but he's been writing about corruption. And I think this is where the uh, uh, disbelief uh, comes in by and large from the public, saying that uh, how can uh, writing about corruption uh, be inciting violence. Well, to uh, help us um, talk to us a little bit more about this, I'm now joined uh, on the line uh, by a Zimbabwean novelist and uh, playwright, uh, filmmaker and activist Tsitsi Dangaremba, who her first novel, some of you may have read it, have heard about it, and if you haven't read it, you've got to read it. It's called Nervous Conditions. And this was acclaimed by literary giants such as Alice Walker and Doris Lessing, as, and is also considered as a book that uh, as uh, one of Africa's most important novels of the 20th century. She joins us now via Zoom. Tsitsi, thanks very much indeed for joining us and uh, welcome to the program. I think she's there. Tsitsi? Oh. Okay, all right, we've had to get her on the line. We're struggling to uh, connect with you. Tsitsi, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, welcome to the program. Thank you, Peter. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. 
All right. So I know that uh, you've been concerned about uh, what happened to Hopewell Chinono, and I suppose in many respects, it's uh, a sign of what's been happening to journalists and writers and voices in general. Yes, Peter, I have been very concerned about what happened to Chingono, um, and I'm concerned that several levels. I'm concerned that the level of a citizen um, about what is happening to our freedom. I'm concerned at the level of a journalist about freedom of the press and freedom of expression. And I'm also concerned at the level of the nation because this indicates uh, a decrease in the democratic space. It indicates that our civil liberties are shrinking. It indi indicates that there is an increase in facts on, on many sectors of the and none of it of Zimbabwe and its people. Uh, would you say that this has been an increasing problem? You know, these are the kinds of things people associated with uh, uh, President Mugabe's rule, where journalists were often jailed, uh, sometimes even tortured, and some even say that uh, were killed. Um, is, are we starting to see a, a, a resurrection of that kind of treatment uh, with journalists and writers in general? Peter, I think that we get cycles in Zimbabwe. There are cycles of relative peace and relative freedom and more freedom of press. And then at critical moments in national trajectory, we see that there is a clampdown. So you're in the 2007, 2008 period of elections, there were clampdowns then. Uh, time up to November 2017, where there was a change of power distribution. Uh, there was a crackdown. And now with the COVID and also with the crisis of the economy making people very discontent, we are seeing down now. The interesting thing now is that the crackdown is again by becoming increasingly possible. So I think that this crackdown is a reflection mood of the people because the, the people are pushed back and necessitate the crackdown. We saw it with um, the FCA, the opposition uh, last month. Um, there were big crackdowns against them. And so basically, at any point where there seems to be increased pressure against the zanu PF government, we do see these crackdowns. All right. You know, um, a few weeks ago, I actually reached out to Hopewell and I wanted to talk to him on the program. And uh, I didn't manage to get it off the ground because he actually went out of town because he had already heard that uh, people were looking for him and he didn't feel safe. Uh, but just before we carry on talking about that, um, we've got a clip of him coming out of uh, uh, court and uh, this is what he said to the media that was standing outside waiting for him. I've been denied bail until they said I should come back on the 7th of August for the fact of reporting what the organizers of the 31st July protested said. So basically journalism has been criminalized. But how are you feeling? Are you okay? I'm okay. I'm fine. Okay. The struggle against corruption should continue. People should not stop. They should carry on with it. All right. And uh, Sitsi, it's going to take brave people like uh, Hopewell to report like the way that he does uh, inside a country knowing that this is something that could happen to them? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's very important that the media in Zimbabwe develop that moral integrity. At the moment, uh, it seems that many Zimbabweans practice different sectors of life are up. So there is a, a public at the moment about enabling of the ZANU PF system, how they oil of the system, 
And uh, I think that applies to people within the profession. You see them in the law, you see them in you see them in the medical profession, you see them in the education profession, absolutely everywhere. And so it is important for us to, to think a little bit more about our moral integrity as a nation, because that is what is going to determine where we end up at the end of the day. And, uh, of course, people are very afraid because Zanu PF has a history of brutality, and this uh, history of brutality goes back to the fourth independence during the armed struggle. Um, at that time, Zanu PF was it's, uh, the, the Zanna army, which is the armed wing of Zanu PF, uh, was fighting the, the Rhodesian army, and that army was also extremely brutal. And so there's always a tendency for an opposing force to take on the characteristics of the force it is opposing. So we ended up with two brutal systems. And then after independence, these two brutal systems came together to create something else, a, a third brutal system. And that is what we are facing. And uh, this is the system that is kicked into action whenever there it seems to be a threat against the ZANU PF retention of power. And so we can understand that people are very afraid. However, um, there is room for, for people to practice their civil liberties. I think we have become accustomed to being very polarized and oppositional so that we don't occupy the middle ground and, ta and uh, take non-violent struggle seriously. So I think that this is something that we have to look at as culture in Zimbabwe, because I don't think that we have to occupy these extreme confrontational positions. And the more we do that, the more fear will become a factor in determining peace behavior. All right, Tsitsi, I'd love to talk to you for much longer, but we've run out of time. But thanks very much indeed uh, for sharing your thoughts with us on this very important issue today. Thank you. All right, that was uh, Tsitsi Dangarembra, who's uh, a renowned author, filmmaker, uh, and also an um, activist uh, talking to us about uh, the situation in Zimbabwe, particularly concerning journalists uh, and writers in general. All right, so let's uh, take a look at newspapers here in South Africa and uh, we rejoin Haupalilwe, who was uh, we're speaking to her a bit earlier on. Uh, thanks so much for joining us once again. Let's talk about uh, what's in the news uh, this weekend. Uh, which paper grabbed your attention? Okay, hi again, Peter. Yeah. Um, so I went to look for, for newspapers and I got two yeah. today, unfortunately. But what really caught my attention was um, the Sunday World with the um, 100 million lawsuit against uh, Angelo Akriti, the former Bosasa COO. Um, I found that interesting because I also did cover a lot of the State Capture Commission and his evidence um, as one of the key witnesses of that commission on Bosasa-related uh, testimony. I think one of the things that I find interesting about the story is the fact that I feel uh, personally that they they actually um, v validating what he said at the commission. Firstly, number one, um, with this 100 million lawsuit by the liquidators, I would have expected it to be more money, um, that um, it would have been more than 100 million because mm -hmm. of the testimony that he gave uh, regarding the amounts of monies that they were siphoning out of that company. Um, so I find that story really, really interesting. I want to really also find out if there are more people who are going to be uh, slapped with a lawsuit um, because there are more players in this and not just Agriti himself. Uh, um, so, yeah, that's, that, that really yeah. caught my attention. I'm just wondering also what's going to be, you know, the conclusion of it because it really does also uh, validate what he had said at the commission. Yeah, and I suppose questions always get raised, don't they, about how can you have someone who's a criminal and you take his word for anything about uh, his testimony. No, exactly, exactly. And I think um, one of the things he's maintained, because I also spoke to him this week after the testimony of um, Environmental Affairs Minister Nombulla Mukanyani, and one of the things that he maintains, even as someone who is guilty himself and confirms that he's guilty, is that he is telling the truth. 
and he's just trying to 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 ensure that people believe him and trust him and he's one of those people who've said i did wrong and i decided to come forward as a whistleblower as well so it is it is kind of tricky but this kind of investigations proves that whatever came out of his mouth mm. there's a lot of truth in it as well all right having spent time with him do you do you get a sense that he's being truthful I do get a sense that he is being truthful, Peter, because it's only a few people who would ever admit and allow themselves to be put under scrutiny like that. Um, we spend quite a lot of time with him and he at the commission was very, very open about any wrong that he has done. And the other thing that was really credible about Agriti was he wasn't just saying things. He had some form of evidence to back it up and prove to back it up. So he gave the State Cape Town Commission um, investigator something to go with. Mm. He wasn't just saying things that require too much work, you know, to corroborate it. As much as the things he's talking about happened a long time ago, because he reminded me of that this week. He was like, I, the things I'm talking about happened a long time ago. I might have gotten a few things wrong here and there, but I remember a lot of it, you know. So I do uh, think he's very truthful because of that. All right. And then the other paper that you picked up? Um, the other paper I picked up is the Sunday Times. And, yeah, the story, obviously, that grabbed my attention was the same story that has grabbed everybody's attention since last week, Sunday. Um, the SIU investigation into those uh, PEE, PPE. PPEs. Protective. PPE contracts. Um, yeah. I, really, I don't know, Peter. Yeah, it's, 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 it's both disappointing because I feel like a lot of South Africans were waiting for something like this because there's already a perception that we have a corrupt government and investigations like this just make you feel like that mm. perception is true despite the fact that it's a perception so um it's quite a concerning thing because you would have never expected that there be people who actually siphon money that is used to fight mm. COVID 19. i mean 95 companies being investigated that is a lot yeah. um and the people who are concerned i mean you have the spokesperson of the president kusela diko's husband um Tandisizwe diko who is also um fingered in this despite the fact that he says he wasn't paid the 125 million which is a lot of money and he claims to have done the work um you also have a lot of players who are also in politics which is quite concerning because we have a country full of entrepreneurs why couldn't those entrepreneurs be brought in here and it's yeah it's, it's 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 one of the stories that grabbed my attention and it's also really really um sad and disappointing to have something like this happen during this time especially all right Khapalil, with that's where we're going to leave it thank you so much indeed and uh, I, I look forward to reading your latest blog <laughs> hello i was just saying thanks very much indeed and that's uh, where we're going to leave it and i look forward to reading your latest blog All right. Uh, she can't hear us, unfortunately. But uh, uh, yeah, we've had a fascinating chat today, I think, uh, talking about blogging, social media, tweeting and that kind of thing. Uh, but before that, uh, before we disappear, we've got someone who sent us a WhatsApp and uh, this is what you had to say. Uh, good morning, Peter. I'm currently watching your interesting program titled Media Monitor. I'm quite surprised that there are uh, not too many news items regarding COVID-19. None of the newspapers are covering the serious water issues in the uh, Ugu region of uh, the Oslo Beach in Port Shepston. That is interesting. All right. Um, I think we're on day 120 something now. So uh, you're not going to get the same stories over and over again, but news stories. But uh, thanks for pointing that out to us. And uh, hopefully our news teams will pick that up. All right, and that's where we're going to have to leave it, unfortunately. Thank you so much indeed for tuning in. And uh, I'd like to end my programs now with us being mindful of uh, the COVID-19 era and the times that we're living in. And so we need to protect each other. So you need to wash your hands, sanitize them, sanitize surfaces, social distance, stay at home as much as you can. And uh, more than anything, please, please wear a mask. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.